Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. A caretaker's job is rarely easy, and sometimes when we are taking care of others, we forget about taking care of ourselves. Today we're talking about a concept called compassion fatigue. Beverly Kyer is a certified compassion fatigue specialist and is the founder and CEO of the Kyer Group, a team of trauma-informed specialists who help those in the helping professions. She works with children and families, as well as those in the criminal justice and foster care systems. David Rages II works for the Edgewood Center for Children and Families as a senior case manager. He has 15 years of experience working in social services. David has overcome his own compassion fatigue by coaching Little League Baseball in his hometown for the past 22 years. Welcome, Beverly, and welcome, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for Thank having me. Thank you for having me. Beverly, can you start us off by telling us what compassion fatigue is? Well, compassion fatigue is a union of secondary traumatic stress disorder and burnout in the lives of people who provide services as helpers, um, also case managers, and also who provide family caregiving for loved ones. Um, it is known that it also resembles vicarious stress, um, where you could have so much exposure to the suffering, the traumas, the tragedy, the chaos, the crisis modes of other people's lives, the long suffering, that the exposure will impact you. It will tax you emotionally, and it will eventually wear your bodies out to the extent that you're really, really putting an enormous effort to help out. So I know both of you have personal experience with compassion fatigue. Tell me about that and what that looked like in each of your lives. Well, for me, um, I was a case manager in Oakland, um, right here in the city, uh, f uh, from about 2002 to 2006, um, right here in West Oakland. Um, I worked with a couple of clients who passed away, and it was really tragic, um, and I wasn't prepared for it. The, the agency that I was working at, um, at the time, they didn't really have too much set up in terms of training for folks to just, you know, in this field, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to really figure out how to develop those boundaries between work and home. And it just, it wasn't there for me. It was too real. And, um, you know, so one of my clients that uh, died, um, it was a domestic violence retaliation. Um, the other one, um, my, uh, I had one client that died of HIV. It was really sad, and I, and, you know, I took a lot of the guilt, the brunt of the guilt. You know, what could I have done? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then, um, you know, right after that happened, somebody was shot right outside of my office, and uh, at that at that point, I just said I couldn't do this anymore. I had to kind of duck out of the mental health field completely, and I took a break for a while, and then I, you know, got back connected uh, with Edgewood in 2006, and. Ever since then, I've been there. It's been great. For myself, I have a lengthy history of working in crisis and trauma. Coming right out of school, I worked with children with cancer and leukemia uh, through a horrific treatment protocol, and many of them lost their battle, and also with their families, parents and grandparents who are struggling with the worst possible diagnosis for a child, um, feeling helpless that they couldn't save them, struggling through the ordeal of the treatment protocols, and then maybe losing their children and having to decide on an autopsy. Also working with the medical team, as much as they're working in what we call pediatrics oncology, you really hope to save lives and they struggled with le losing lives. So I was able to help in many, many ways, uh, but I didn't count the cost, the impact on myself. I was really, really client focused on helping to alleviate the suffering and kind of guide people through the process. Then I went to work with uh, veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder coming back from Vietnam and you could imagine similar to uh, Iraqi returning veterans in Afghanistan, returning veterans, suicides, depression, domestic violence, um, uh, destructive kinds of behaviors. Um, that was quite an ordeal as well, sometimes very threatening behaviors because it may get psychotic in your office as well. And people mm -hmm. lost their lives. We had suicides, some on my caseload, and you never forget those things. Mm -hmm. And then I, I stayed in the system working with veterans from all backgrounds, but in the psychi uh, psychiatric department. I left there in about 16 years and came to work with children in foster care and all levels of abuse, neglect some of the most imaginable things happening and some of those children have become severely emotionally disturbed and there again we were facing you know the substance the depression and some suicides on the caseload and all in all 
I felt so called and so passionate, so missioned about this work that I could do it and felt on it that I could help. But again, I didn't count the cost on me. And toward the end of the tenure of each uh, service, changes began to happen to me, you know, like emotional uh, moods, like a breakout cry over nothing, um, mm. become explosive, temperamental, which was out of character for me. Also some things like confusion and forgetting stuff and clumsiness and just not being able to be myself. And um, someone else needed to ask me, well, what's going on with you and are you really considering what this work is doing? And it wasn't the work, it was the fact that I didn't consider that I needed to take care of myself concurrent with taking care of them. So I collapsed, I suffered heart failure. Mm -hmm. Not once, but twice, because it was my nature to go back into the same you know, driven help mode without regard to it. After the second time I learned that you need to take care of ourselves and do some intentional self-care concurrent with doing this work and providing services to others who are suffering. And thank God that you made it through the first heart failure and could learn that lesson because I'm sure not everyone is so lucky. <laughs> that is exactly the way I feel about it. That's what made it such a mission to me. The fact that I lived through two mm -hmm. episodes of that, I am determined that that was my purpose to come back and talk to other people in the field all across the country not only in the field, but again, family caregivers about the importance of self-care and how to do it. And David, how did you know, what signs did you have that you were struggling with compassion fatigue, that maybe something was going on that you needed to take care of? Well, definitely, um, it was a lot of the same things. I was really struggling, just trying to get the work done. Um, I didn't want to come in to work. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't want, I just didn't want to be there. It was so emotionally draining just to be at, at work every day. You know, waiting for, watching the clock, waiting, to get out of there um, and then just you know always being on edge you know um, not really ever being able to relax you know and during that time um, you know I'm talking about the first time because this I, I had another you know some uh, some other events happen mm -hmm. um, here at Edgewood and so the difference was is that you know I was able to go I've been to a lot of trainings with Bev I was at a, some other trainings um, and um, I had a really, really supportive uh, team that I worked with. I worked with at Edgewood, and so I think that um, you know I, I had almost the same thing. Two mirroring things. I had uh, two of my own personal clients um, die. You know, suddenly one was um, shot by a police officer, and the other one committed suicide. And uh, both times, my team was really, really supportive, and um, really, really able to. You know, come to my aid, help me out, and give me the things I need. You know, encourage me to take time for myself. Mm -hmm. Encourage me to, you know, just do those things that are fun to me. And, you know, to really separate my personal life from my work life. And that's what I did. And that's how I was able to really, you know, get through those, those, those really hard and emotional times. Mm -hmm. Beverly, who would you say is affected most by compassion fatigue? It's hard to say who's affected most by it. Um, Anyone who works intently and, uh, and uh, consistently in a crisis-oriented or crisis-driven environment is susceptible to be affected. Anyone who bears witness, listens to stories, has trauma images repeating on them because of what they see, what they hear, what they experience, what they know, or the losses of people. Sometimes um, people like David, uh, which I was so impressed with, figured out that he needed to do something to, you know, shift the brain chemistry for himself to some more positive things. They will do better sooner than someone who ignores and does not understand what happens to them in the course of doing the work, what the cost of caring is. Uh, those people will be in far more trouble. Um, they're at risk for <laughs> losing families, not mm -hmm. even being able to cope with families, substance use and uh, depression themselves, and some of them, our colleagues, have committed suicide as well mm -hmm. because they could not get past what they felt was a failure when they lose mm -hmm. a client or, or a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just talking to a group uh, just this week, and it was a child death, a suicide in the department. I work with organizations, and uh, they're really doing a vigilant watch of the worker of that mm -hmm. child because she's not processing, and she's at risk. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say who's most, but the people who don't understand, who are not educated about this, are far more at risk, mm -hmm. I'd put it that way. 
I would say one good thing about being in a helping profession is, as you guys both mentioned, you have a team to sort of keep an eye on you. Mm -hmm. What if you're someone who's a family caregiver, you know, you're caring for an ailing parent or a grandparent, mm -hmm. and you might not necessarily have that support around you. What does that mm -hmm. look like? And do those folks also suffer from compassion fatigue but don't have the support Major to get out of it? time. I was thinking about that coming here. How many instances I know of family caregivers is usually, say there's a family of three or five siblings, is usually one child that has a full responsibility for the parent mm -hmm. and the others either cannot face it or deal with uh, that struggle with the parent or really just decided they just don't have the time. Um, so that, that person is at high risk. It, it's, it's complicated also by the fact when they have uh, the caregiver also has their own household and their own uh, immediate family mm -hmm. to take care of, and they're trying to manage both of these and appointments and medication protocols and and work and, work, yes. and go to work, and it's just no turn off. It's no turn off. So even when you're um, available or not available, you're thinking and you're worrying and you're concerned 24 hours, or even when you think you're sleeping. It has been said uh, a few times by people in the the field who specialize in trauma is that very often the caretaker could succumb to a serious illness and lose their life before the people they're providing care for. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the variations. If you're caring for your elderly parents is one thing, your siblings, a spouse, caring for your children, the worries, the concerns, the nature of the illness, all determines just how intense it could be, how relentless it could be, or maybe you could manage. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of uh, caregivers who take care of their grandkids. That's the program mm. I work with in San Mateo County. And uh, that comes into play a lot. Compassion fatigue comes into play a lot. And a lot of my work is just really being a supportive ear for those caregivers around the issues that they're having with their kids. And as well as, you know, we have a support group that is specifically for that so that the caregivers can come around, sit at the table, mm -hmm. and talk about the different things that are going on in their lives. And they really f leave that mm -hmm. feeling a lot more fulfilled and a lot more energized in order to, you know, continue to move on. And, you know, we just encourage that they continue to move on and do the job that they're doing. Yeah. I've seen one or two of the groups. They're really wonderful. They do, notwithstanding, when a person is continuously kind of bombarded with that level of responsibility and worry and concern, they don't get to think out the box and listening to other people with suggestions and ideas of how to organize that, how to manage it, or how to delegate some of it, or when to take time. And is this really valuable for some of them to be able to sustain? What are some typical red flags of compassion fatigue, either wow. in yourself or others? I know you guys spoke about your personal experiences, but maybe your personal experience might look different from someone else's. It is. It's different. It's, it's different for everybody, depending on where they come from, their orientation, their sense of responsibility or not. What messages did you have about helping others? And also a message that said, if you take care of yourself, that's selfish. So some yeah. of those things would definitely fall in the realm of, you know, spiritual impacts. You could just see people lose hope and lose mm -hmm. faith and lose a sense of purpose and the cognitive pieces could happen to people where they're just, you could be locked down in a kind of rigidity. Mm -hmm. You just keep doing and doing and pushing and pushing but your, your intervention doesn't work but you can't see it. And that's something you might notice in people. Um, also, it could be an explosive temperament or the person who chooses to be withdrawn. It's not so much a choice, it's just their nature to hold it in and those people sometimes are far more at risk. We're looking at people who look, look like they are, they have apathy, like nothing is affecting them and we always talk about how concerned we are. If you don't, you know, cry it out, scream it out, cuss it out and you're holding all of that in, that's how you see some of your explosive situations like we observe in the media mm -hmm. where somebody just blows and nobody even saw it coming. Mm. Uh, some people have eating consumption or drinking consumption kinds of things or as David mentioned um, a kind of hyper vigilance and hyper alertness you're always on alert that the next danger or threat or risk may happen and staying in that state the kind of chemistry you're creating in your system with stress hormone it's this is not, yes it is it wears mm -hmm. you out saying that exhausting some people will sleep afterwards because they can't face another thing and then some people are just all hyper, all over the place, uh, need, as a method to try to cope. Then you might see a lot of depression or just a depleted nature in people where they just completely crash. And above all, there's the physical things that could happen. And it's perhaps sometimes the least noticeable. I always 
hope sometimes, and this sounds weird, that compassion and fatigue causes a little pain, a little jab, so you pay attention to it. But the physical things that could happen is so insidious, the way it creeps up on you, you don't know you're sick until you're really, really sick. And we have a art, I, I say in our field, of being able to minimize and rationalize what's going on mm -hmm. within our own bodies because the client is important, the child is important, not us. So those are just a few things, but there are cognitive impacts, emotional, behavioral, um, spiritual, interpersonal impacts, real, real changes where relationships could just come apart because you have nothing left to give. What's the difference between compassion fatigue and burnout? Big difference to me. You could get burned out because you're a file clerk. You work in a store. You're producing products. It's a lot of functional tasks. It's just too many of them, just constant, constant movement, meetings and deadlines or management issues and staff conflicts, stuff could wear you out. I la laughingly joke when I was coming out of college, I worked as a file clerk in an insurance company. That stack of files just kept growing and growing. You can get burnt out from that. Um, compassion fatigue on the other end, though, is not the kind of things you could put out of your mind on Saturday, you know, and go have fun. It's about human suffering, human tragedy, the threat of risk, loss of life or danger. Um, these are not the things you could dismiss, put on the shelf and forget about. It stays with you. Even when you think you're sleeping sometime, you're concerned about unfinished and unresolved issues that could lead to the detriment of somebody's safety or well-being. So that's compassion fatigue. It, it's the stories, it's the pictures, it's the images. Think about Sandy Hook. And you weren't there, but you have images and you could imagine. That could lead, that could become so consuming if that was a part of your life, you had to work in those situations, uh, that it could really just haunt you and wear on you. Mm -hmm. It's hard to dismiss, I guess that's the word to say. Because we care so much about human people, those stories stick with us. David, how common is it for folks with compassion fatigue to have guilt? And in your experience, did you ever have any guilt at any point? I think it's very common. I think um, in, from my own experience, um, I definitely found myself just thinking to myself, what could I have done different in the situations? You know, um, I'm not, I wasn't a primary caregiver. I was a secondary caregiver. I was, you know, I was involved with the families to support them, to give them services that they need. When I was working in Oakland, I was working with individuals to give them services and to try to connect them with community resources. And so in both times, I just, I, I wondered, you know, what could I have done differently? And I, and I, you know, I beat myself to death just thinking, what could I have done differently? And, and really, there was nothing I could have done differently. I know that now, you know, and I wish, I, I wish somebody could have sent, came in and told me that at that time. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when, when things happened again, here, when I was working at Edgewood a few years back, um, that was the first thing everybody said to me, Dave, there was nothing you could have done differently. You know, you did the best you could have done working with the, the individuals and just things kind of happened that way. And, and you know, and it, it kind of opened my eyes and I continued to get more education about, the, about this and, and really realized that, mm -hmm. you know, this was something that, you know, it was natural. The guilt was natural, mm -hmm. but I had to really, you know, um, acknowledge it in myself that it was some, there was nothing that I could have done differently. Guilt also drives you to mm. work almost in a desperation mode. Mm -hmm. That's what also could help many of us get sick. I, I would call guilt maybe the Achilles heel of the service provider. Um, when you are responsible for the safety of people, not just helping them move on, but really responsible for their well-being, and you know that there's a multitude of risk factors personal and interpersonal, internal and external risk factors. You just push and push and push to try to avert that, avoid it, prevent it. All times in the court, sometimes trying to change the situation. Guilt was what helped me not pay attention to what was going on with me. I did, was it one more child, one more family, let me just stay with this, let me, even when people warned me that I was in a slide and I think you had something like this too. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hear it because I felt too responsible. It would have been less of a person to walk away when there's so much need that in my mind superseded my need. Yeah. So guilt is quite a issue for us all. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm.
How can one take care of themselves both in the moment of extreme stress as well as on an ongoing basis? David, I know your thing is Little League and that keeps you well. Mm -hmm. um, what would each of your recommendations be both to others and what do you do for yourselves? Well, you know, I, I definitely talk about Little League because Little League has been in my life since I was 15 years old. I've been coaching and I played Little League when I was, you know, 10, 11, I mean 11 and 12 in my hometown of East Palo Alto. Now, early on coaching, it was just, it was fun. It was something to do with the kids and to have fun for my community and give back. Later on, I realized that this was something that I needed to keep in my life, that I had to do this in order just to really survive in the field that I, that I chose to work in. And so it was just really, really a good release. I'm out there with the kids, I'm having fun, I'm yelling and screaming, they yelling and screaming. And it's just, it's just a fun environment. Um, other things though, like, you know, we live here in the Bay Area, it's a beautiful area. The beach is close, the, the mountains are close, skiing is close. You know, especially for folks in this field, I, I just, you know, let them know that it's really, really important to do things for yourself, to get away, you know, get out of this environment and go have some fun with your own personal time. Mm -hmm. You know, don't spend your personal time thinking about work, you know. Just enjoy your family, enjoy your friends. You know, whatever it is you like to do, do it. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do this or you shouldn't be able to do this or it's, you don't have time. No, get it done and, and have fun. And that way when you come back to work, you'll be re-energized and ready to go and to continue to care about our clients. Mm -hmm. I agree with that 100%. I'm, I'm a late learner. I didn't learn as fast <laughs> as he did. But in the moment for me is, and this is something I try to tell people to do, is to realize the mind-body connection. At the minute something is beginning to escalate or it becomes a tense or you know you got to go into a situation that's risky for them or for you, um, is ask yourself, where am I in the moment? Just to pay attention to yourself. Um, don't go in with the notion that you can fix the situation. Don't personalize it. What you could do is create the environment for them to kind of regulate and, and decompress a little bit. But that means that you need to do it first yourself. Uh, I, I call this like dual awareness. I look at you and say if you're the person escalating um, in terms of a safety factor, if that's a risk, take a step back and just breathe, really, really deep breathe and just release some of the tension out of my body as I'm being present and looking at you. That's important to do. I also do some tactical things, like with hands and touch and texture, just so I can stay sensitive to my own self and kind of self-soothe as I'm allowing you to come down because I'm regulated. Um, and then after those situations, you also not to personalize it. Uh, people in pain, people who are suffering, oftentimes hurt the people who are trying to help because you're there. And so not to remind yourself not to, so I'm saying I'm doing a lot of self-talk in the moment. And then afterwards I've learned to walk away and run to somebody like David right away, <laughs> the talk and process and mm -hmm. kind of let that off. And you know, he got a great sense of humor. So I like people with a sense of humor just after we kind of process a little bit, make me laugh, you know, or mm -hmm. say, or also I believe in accountability partners. There are mm -hmm. people like David, other people in my life that, will just come take me by the hand and say, we're going to take a walk right now. You're not going to do another thing until you just have a moment. And I've learned, as I said late, to have a lot of fun, a lot of humor, some good books, good movies, literature, art, the theater. I can watch movies, a marathon, you know, and, and do stuff like that, go out to eat and get with my friends. Uh, that's so important to do, just to level yourself out, and the creative things. I believe firmly in that. I happen to know chemistry-wise, brain chemistry-wise, that when you engage in creative arts, is this a shift in the chemistry that kind of overrides the toxicity you've just stepped out of. Mm -hmm. And I tell people whether you are talented or not, just the process of creating something beautiful, making something, drawing art, macrame, crochet, anything is a help. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but before we go, Beverly, I know you have a new book coming out. Yes. Um, tell us about that and how folks can learn more in depth about compassion fatigue. Well, I hope that the book will be published in October. That's my goal, but I've been known to be overly ambitious. So, but start looking for it and look at for it on my website. Um, I do not notify people as it gets closer to the process. But this book, I decided to write uh, based on my experiences and working in my trainings, that people love your personal story because in my story uh, they can see themselves. This is relatable, this is applicable, this makes sense. For one thing, 
people love to hear that I've gotten in trouble or I lost track or as David mm -hmm. said, you know, I just, and to be able to feel that kind of commonality is important. So I made the book uh, my story, uh, which led to my mission, which is a big piece of it. And then a gift, it's the gift of knowledge to understand this condition, uh, how it could come about, what the warning signs are, how to help, and what techniques and strategies that we should use to both release some of the uh, uh, disturbing content, uh, refuel yourself and recharge yourself, and then how to maintain, because mm -hmm. no one ever has to get as sick as I did. No one has to reach the point where they want to leave the field if they learn mm -hmm. how to do something consistent all the time. So that's all in that book. And uh, like I said, I hope it's out in October. That's exciting. Well, congratulations on that. I can't wait to read it when it comes out. And thank, thank you, you, Beverly, and thank you, David, for thank joining me so today much. and sharing this valuable information. Really thank you for it. having us. You can learn more about the Kyer Group by visiting its website at thekyergroup.org. Help for the Helper, Self-Care Strategies for Managing Burnout and Stress is a book by Babette Rothschild and Marjorie Rand that contains a mix of case vignettes and easy to follow exercises. Breath Training, 3-6 Breathing, Window into the Nervous System is a video presented by Dr. Anna Baranowski that teaches viewers how to perform true deep breathing. You can see this and similar videos on the Traumatology Institute YouTube channel. Think you might be suffering from compassion fatigue but aren't totally sure? Be sure to take the compassion fatigue test from American Continuing Education. You can find it for free through an internet search. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.